thank you. Thank you for coming, and it's a great pleasure to, to be asked to moderate this um, part of the India series that Milan Vaishnav and, and others are doing excellent work here. Um, and I like the title, Will India's Economics Be a Victim of Its Politics? And I think D.C., Washington, D.C., is the perfect place to pose <laughs> a question about what politics can do uh, to an economy. And I think I've got two, two excellent people to answer it in India's case. I'm sitting with me, starting with Ila Patnaik, who I've known for, for many years, who is, um, which I won't read it out, <laughs> uh, who is um, a senior fellow at the National Institute of um, Public Finance and Policy in New Delhi, a columnist for the Indian Express and the Financial Express, and on various government commissions, uh, most recently for financial reform? Yeah. Right. Um, and then to my left, Jahangir Az- Aziz, who's the... Sorry, you're <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I was about to say, i give you a generic title, but who is Head of Emerging Markets Asia at J.P. Morgan and Chief India Economist, yes. or yeah. uh, formerly an advisor at the Indian Ministry of Finance, and before that, the head of the China unit IMF. at the IMF. Um, so welcome to both of you. Um, so let me just start off by asking a very f- simple question. Um, st- I'll start with you. Uh, India's slowed down to, what, 3.5%, as low as 3.5% growth this year. Might pick up to 5 55 next year. But it's a very, very far cry from the first decade of this century. Yeah. Um, when most other emerging markets were growing very healthily too. No. Now, Ruchia Sharma makes, I think, the very plausible claim that India's miracle um, was actually pretty average, mm-hmm. given the credit, easy credit of the first decade of this century, and that it doesn't slip back into that mm-hmm. um, uh, very easily. Uh, much, much more painful reforms and changes will be required at the, the union level and the state level for India to get back to those kinds of growth rates. What's, what's wrong with that Ruchia Sharma assumption? Uh, Why isn't he right? So you can spin a story which will fit that description, of that narrative extremely well. Mm-hmm. Um, you look at globalization, uh, you look at 2003 to 2008, uh, most emerging market countries were averaging six and a half, seven. Therefore, India's 9% average doesn't sound extraordinary. Then comes the slowdown. In the slowdown, uh, India really gets hammered, both in 2008 uh, and for a variety of reasons. Um, But subsequently, growth goes up in 2010, 11 to about uh, 11% and thing in 2011, and then things come collapsing down. The question is, in that collapsing down, that story makes sense, except quantitatively it's very difficult to look at the decline of proxies that you use for the decline in um, global demand, mm-hmm. the increase or the, or the tightening of financial conditions, so the opposite of the easy credit conditions that you talked about, and, and, and use those and try and figure out, uh, and, 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 and the amount of slowdown that those two factors would uh, predict, India slowed down much more than that. Mm-hmm. So... So qualitatively, the storyline, you know, it's a great storyline to say, but quantitatively, you can't match it. What explains that additional slowdown is the fact that since 2009 and 10, any proxy of government policy dysfunction that you use more or less perfectly matches that slowdown. Mm -hmm. Uh, So quantitatively, we would say at least one and a half to two percentage points of the slowdown that has taken place since 2009. 10, 11 onwards is attributable to essentially the bad politics. Bad, bad, policy, bad policy. Which by implication <clears throat> means the first 10 years had some good politics uh, over and above the easy credit factor. Or not as bad, politi- as, as bad a policy as we've seen since 2009. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think benign neglect was far better mm-hmm. than active uh, neglect. Now, another way of putting the same question, Ila. Um, is about a year ago, India looked like it might be on the verge of a credit rating downgrade to junk, to junk status. And that galvanized, or at least helped galvanize, the 
uh, Mamo and Singh reshuffle, which brought Chidambara back into the finance ministry and a sort of a flurry of medium-sized reforms were announced with that. Um, do you think India is out of the woods? Do you think the possibility of a downgrade of junk bond status is, is now ruled out? Or is that, is that something that could very well come back in the next year or two, depending on mm. the politics? So there are two things that go on, go into the uh, credit rating process. One is what's happening to the fiscal deficit as such, and the other is what is happening to growth. So the, the fiscal deficit as a ratio of GDP is something that I think Chidambaram will deliver on that because he's just, he's so clear that I don't want to downgrade at the moment, that we'll do what it takes. And a bit might be jugglery and a bit and might even be... Even with a 10,000 crore food security bill. Yeah, because, you know, you can always not roll it out at full speed. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to roll it out at full speed. Mm -hmm. So you, you can manage that. I, I think that he'll be able to meet his fiscal deficit targets. But the other part of what's going on, which is growth, that's also going to feed into the uh, thinking of uh, credit rating agencies and whether they decide to keep India where it is or to downgrade further. And there, uh, I, I think there are three things going on you know, on growth. And I don't disagree with what Jahagir uh, is saying, but just to put it differently. One, there is a structural story. And that structural story is that you know, we grew so fast uh, in the last 10 years that our institutions were not able to match up. And what we needed to do along the way was to change laws, to build institutions, to find mechanisms for allocating resources, you know, to move away from the old system. But we stuck to the discretionary, non-transparent mm -hmm. sort of uh, government handing out things. And that's clearly falling apart. And that's, that's one part of the story. The other is that there are cycles and you know emerging markets are going through a cycle where a lot of them are today facing uh, slower growth and this is this is part of the cyclical downturn but thirdly i think we have exacerbated the cycles by our pro cyclical uh, macro policies and so we've really uh, when when you know we were at uh, 10% we were not trying to contract. We didn't have, at that time, we had a very high uh, fiscal deficit. So we, we were really not, uh, even monetary policy, we were, we were pegging the exchange rate and getting pro-cyclical monetary policy because capital flows were pro-cyclical. So we were exacerbating the cycle. Now, coming back to the last two, three years, you've seen a fiscal expansion and a monetary expansion between 2009 and 2010, and that, has just led to a lot of inflation because uh, perhaps it was more than what was required. So growth did go up, but you know we are facing its well, problems. We, we, we live in the era of sex. I mean, uh, uh, improbable though it sounds, sexy global central bankers, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, Raghuram Rajan is one of them. Mark, Mark Carney is another. <laughs> Raghu's um, seen the rupee appreciate since he took this job. And he's made some very sort of clear and welcome announcements simplifying regulation of bank branches. Um, has, has there, is, is too much hope being invested in this guy? Or does this reflect the fact that if you have a good person with freedom of action running an important institution in India, lots of stuff can happen? It's mostly a hypothetical proposition, but with Raghu Rajan, this is, this is actually bearing out so far? So I would really think that uh, what matters is how much is he going to change the institution? How much is he going to mm -hmm. change RBI? And if he's able to do that, and their leadership does matter. So it absolutely matters who is in charge. Does he put in time and effort into reforming this organization? And uh, if you're aware of the latest uh, developments on what, are, what is being proposed in terms of reforms is that RBI should be uh, stripped of many of its other responsibilities and primarily become an inflation targeting central bank. And if he's able to not just help in getting the law changed, which is being proposed already, but also in getting uh, the research department built up in setting up an independent monetary policy committee, in actually going after it both in the uh, spirit of the law and uh, the 
human capital and capacity required to do that, if he can change RBI, then that will have a very big impact. Because uh, today RBI, it's not just the person who's there. RBI is conflicted. They have too many objectives, yeah. and these are conflicting objectives. And you cannot expect one person to solve all those if the mandate given to the institution is not clear. Mm -hmm. But there has been clarity in terms of the monetary policy. It may, maybe I'll direct this. Um, no. Is ragu the best thing since sliced bread or sliced, <laughs> sliced chapati, whatever the right? Uh, um, <laughs> yes, probably. <laughs> um, I mean, he's brought in a lot of expectation. Um, but unfortunately, nothing that he's done so far has actually been tested. Mm -hmm. So if you look at what he has done and the reaction of the market to that, uh, it's very strongly coincided with the FOMC right. delaying tapering. So we really do not know what the counterfactual is. So just to give you a sense, so since the FOMC uh, the delay happened, um, Indian, the, the rupee has appreciated only one percentage point more than the Brazilian rial or the Turkish lira. So this fits in with the Ruchi Shama view of the world. Absolutely. Now, um, and, and to make matters worse, so, it, so well, you know, in May, June, July, those three months, uh, the monthly current account deficit was probably running around $10 billion. In the last three months, it's running about $2 billion. On top of that, the RBI has taken out the entire oil demand by the local oil companies out of the spot market and taken it on RBI. So oil companies today transact directly with RBI and not through the spot market, which is about, what, $5, 6000000000 billion a month? So if you have $2 billion of current account deficit, of which you're taking out $5, 6000000000 billion out, you're essentially running a current account surplus of about three, four billion dollars. So even with a current account surplus of three, four billion dollars, and the tapering being off, EM assets back in play, the rupee still hasn't managed to get past 61. And I mean, look, if we're so, going to focus on individual making a difference, the conversation amongst non geeks. Is not about a central banker. It's about Narendra Modi, <laughs> um, and that's you know clearly the great. And I'm going to put yeah. this to both of you because yeah. this is such a huge, hugely important issue. Is the uncertainty about what the outcome of next spring's general election is going to be um, a um, a drag on growth, or conversely, or concomitantly, if if there is a sort of clear outcome and there is confidence that this might be um, a slightly more um, efficient coalition government that comes into place, how big an impact would that have on growth? And I'll put that to you first, Elif, and then we'll drill down into what I like and dislike about Modi in a minute. But. <laughs> so so uh, I'm not really seeing a single party, even the BJP. None of the opinion polls seem to be suggesting that you will have a single party uh, get in. Uh, but uh, I don't think that's a problem. So, you know, put Modi aside for a moment. I mean, the big fear is we'll have a third front. In Hindi, we call it a Mili Judi Sarkar. You know, some random characters put together who will form a government. And uh, whether it's that, whether it's Jailalita supported by Modi, whether it's Modi, whether it's Manmohan Singh back, I don't think that yeah, it makes uh, much difference. That it is at this stage going to make that much of a difference. To the so it think might it be make a difference? no, it might make a difference to the markets. Mm -hmm. So sentiment might change. So if you you know uh, business supports Modi and is very optimistic about him, so sentiments might change. But will investment come back on track tomorrow? Because investment, what are the problems that we have and how many of those problems can be solved and at what speed? So there are problems which will take some time to get solved. And my sense is that immediately, we, with, even if we have uh, you know, whoever in charge, you're not going to get a rapid turnaround. You might see Sensex Nifty go up, but right. are you going to get a rapid turnaround in investment growth? Unlikely. Unlikely. Just out of interest, what would be your best case realistic outcome 
for next um, for next May. Best case, and what would be the, 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 the dispensation in Delhi you'd like to see most in terms of economic reform? So I'm not a, in terms of economic reform. Which which government? So I I'm I think that whether it is, there, there are three possibilities that I see, and uh, or actually there are many. But let me say top three would be that it could be a BJP led government. It could be a UPA uh, government, or it could be somebody like Jailalita being supported by uh, NDA. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of economic reforms, I don't see that much of a difference. I mean, there might be some policies on which some of them will go slower than the others. BJP might say, OK, we'll get last time they came up with roads as you know the NHAI. That was something that they pushed. But then what did they come up with? They came up with the PFRDA. And then they opposed it for the next 10 years. So I'm not very clear about if Modi does come in or if BJP does come in, I don't even know very clearly what their economic policy, what their agenda is. Because if I go by what they supported and opposed in the last uh, 10 years, uh, I would think that's the worst thing that can happen because they'll oppose the GST, they'll oppose FDI in Explain retail. Some of this. I mean, okay. The goods okay. and services tax. The goods and services tax, which will make the tax system much more efficient, which they had proposed. When originally, but when they, so I don't know whether now they support it because they had originally proposed it, or they will oppose it because for ten years they opposed it. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, does it make no difference whether Jayal Ali uh, or you know Chidambaram is prime minister? Um, I think it doesn't to to a large extent, and I'm going to start off from a point that Ila made. That in so one way of looking at this growth slowdown is that we didn't make any institutional changes in that 10 years, and that these institutions uh, really required the framework to be changed. Uh, no change in the investment framework, no change in the way in which resources of India were being priced, nothing of that sort of happened. Another way of looking at it is to say that the institutions that delivered for 60 years, 3% growth rate, all of a sudden started delivering growth rate at 10%. Mm -hmm. And when it was delivering 10% growth rate, no one asked the question, how come institutions that were delivering a 3% growth rate for about 60 years suddenly is delivering growth at 10%? Mm -hmm. Today, because growth rate has come down, urban middle class have suddenly turned self-righteous and indignant, and all of a sudden, urban middle class is questioning that institution. They're even considering voting in the next election. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and... I think the role that was played by the technocracy and the implicit contract, I would say, to lack of a better word, between the technocracy and the politicians, that got broken down in the last two, three years. And whether it's a Jalalitha government or as a BGP government or an UPA3 government, they have to go back and repair that relationship back. In the absence of somebody doing that... Can, can I just challenge you on that? I mean, 1996, and you'll both remember this well, after five years of Narasimha Rao yep. and Mamo and Singh economic reform, yep. um, which had dominated the world's view of, uh, of India. Um, Yogendra Yadav, India's, India's um, leading electoral, um, uh, leading sophologist, I guess, um, polled voters, exit polls, and only 11% knew that economic reforms had happened. Yep. Um, how do you connect the technocracy to the masses in India to get a mandate for economic reform? How do you do that? Is it easier now than it was I, I, in 1996? I'm not sure. that's, mean, that's, uh, because presumably this is part of the question, will India be able to reform and grow at a high rate? I mean, governance isn't an irrelevant. Yeah, so, so, so if Ila had her way, she would change the institutional structure. There would be institutional reforms. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the investment framework would change. The manner in which resources are priced to change, the manner in which services are being delivered would change in, a, in the manner in which she wrote the uh, Indian Financial Code. Uh, in reality, that will take a very, very long time to happen, the actual change in the institutions. So in, in the middle, you're left with the technocracy trying to navigate within the same institutional setup, mm -hmm. making sure that you, know, you are easing off on some things, you're not doing on some things, you're making sure that you don't get, you know, nothing really falls apart through the cracks. 
And that's how you're delivering growth. And what would happen if Jahangir got his way? I, I think uh, there is a lot more pressure today for transparency and less discretion. Mm -hmm. So that's something that the government has to confront. Whoever, whoever is there in power has to confront. And earlier they were getting away without confronting it. You know, they, they tried to find ways and they could navigate their system through the existing institutions. I'm not sure that looking ahead at the next five years or ten years, that that's going to be uh, acceptable to people. They, the, the push for, I mean, look at the coal scam, for example. One could have, uh, people are today questioning and the, uh, Do you want to the, give a quick thumbnail of coal gate? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, the policy framework in place was that a government committee would decide. Or an even uh, quicker thumbnail. I mean, just the scale of corruption. Okay. So, so that I don't interrupt the, the point. Of the I'm, I'm yeah, interrupting no, no. it twice. <laughs> <laughs> Big journalistic punchy. <laughs> Okay. Massive corruption is going to have to do with that. No, no, yeah. no. Okay. So, right. <laughs> 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 shortcomings of journalism. No. I'll leave it to the, you. the question is uh, no, no, Ed, what is corruption? If I have a policy framework in place which says that the government will allocate coal, and then there are ministers who say, okay, this is how we're going to allocate coal, and then coal mines, okay, because otherwise it was only a public sector enterprise that got coal, and now you start giving it to users who, captive users, the who will. Know, extract the coal and use it. And that was the policy framework in place. Now, if someone does allocate coal within that policy framework, is it corruption? It has not violated any law. In fact, the problem with the investigative agency today is that though they feel that lots of favors have been done, but there was no quid pro quo. There was nobody took money to do anything. How do you establish corruption if this is getting very philosophical. So <laughs> I'm right, you're doing a very good job. But it's that um, let me, let me, because I know in a moment I'm going to have to go to questions. I haven't got a, a watch on me, but um, let me just sort of get back to the Modi thing. Part of the reason why a lot of the middle classes are yearning for Modi and some foreign investors is because he has a reputation for quick project execution. The delays, the setbacks, the continual recostings that we associate with Government of India projects and the permissions are supposedly absent in Gujarat and he would at least be able to address uh, or, or identify that as a big problem if he were Prime Minister. Um, it, that's not an unreasonable expectation, is it, for, for a Modi Prime Ministership? Yes, but you know, to go back to that philosophical point, <laughs> <laughs> if I may. If then the Environment Ministry opposes a project clearance has been given to, and there is no clear law in place, or the law in place actually allows somebody to go to court and say, sure, stop, what will the Prime Minister do? So what you need is institutional change. It is today not enough to say that somebody will come in and do something. Yes, he may be able to do something, sure. So you need a powerful, you need a prime minister's or PMO that is more effective, more functional, stronger, and so on. But if the institutional framework doesn't change, and today there is a cabinet committee on investment that is trying to give clearances to projects, and what is stopping it? The laws. So you do need to have institutional change. There, are, there aren't, I don't think there are shortcuts anymore. This government would have tried all the shortcuts. I mean, you know, they're also seeing that growth is... Has this government tried institutional change? It, it can't be done that fast. Right, because so you need political will to have institutional reform. Right? You, you do, you do. And but sorry, I'm going to get you um, into very abstruse <laughs> philosophy, but my, my fault, but you, what's your you, view? No, because but there is no consensus on that institutional change. So let's look at the example of consensus that we've actually seen, Latin America. 1980s, Latin America go into a massive debt crisis, 1980 to 1990s. That's the rise of middle class Latin America. From 1990, middle of 1990s till today, there is a consensus across Latin America what should be macroeconomic policy framework. And if you look at most countries, except Brazil in the last few years, most countries have stuck to that. 
uh, fiscal deficit need to be controlled, inflation has to be brought down, and you do not interfere with the exchange rate. So there is some sort of a middle class consensus that you have been created. In India, there is no middle class consensus that has been created. Uh, middle class would be perfectly happy if, let's say, the current um, in the cab super cabinet committee who is supposed to you know, decide, approve the, um, the, these, these stalled projects are ab is able to do that. Uh, and, you know, in terms of growth models, um, I would say that Gujarat is a growth model, but s equally successful as a Madhya Pradesh growth model, which is also run by the BGP government, equally successful as a Jharkhand growth model by the BGP government, and by BGP allied the Bihar growth model. So there is nothing to say that the uh, Gujarat growth model is somehow superior and, the, and across dimensions, not just economic dimensions, but social dimensions, it is very difficult to say that the Gujarat good model delivered better um, welfare, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word, better welfare than the Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand, or the Bihar, Bihar model delivered. Do you agree with that? Yeah, pretty much. Because, uh, I mean, one can... I look at investment data, and when I look at... Uh, and, and that's really what business is talking about. So then they don't. They, they often say that we don't want to worry about infant mortality. So don't tell us about yep. whether how bad infant mortality is or not. But I just look at investment data, and we, Gujarat has not performed better than Maharashtra. Yep. Maharashtra has performed better. So uh, both are above the All India average, and Guj Maharashtra is more above the All India average than Gujarat is. So I mean that's a that's a good model. I'm, but Maharashtra, Gujarat, so. You know, which whoever can get investment in. A quick, very short answer from both of you, then I will get a question. Um, whoever gets elected next May, what would be the top three things that you would like to see to change the economic perspective? <laughs> okay, so uh, first is, of course, what I've been working on, <laughs> 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 which is financial sector legislative reforms. At the moment, particularly because of the growth downturn, there's scam after scam after scam. There's no consumer protection. There's just the regulation is so poor. And that's we've got a ready uh, draft law. We've got uh, everything in place. They should just go for it. So that's number one. Number two, I think that uh, they really need to start doing a similar effort, which was a two-year-long effort on thinking about and redrafting laws about the environment. Because environment is an issue that is, you will have a trade-off at a stage of the growth of an economy like this. People are going to, you know, some. There are always some losers and some gainers, and these will be issues that need to be resolved. Otherwise, we are not going to get the investment in place. I would say at least the acceptance of low growth or lower growth for the next three years. I think that's to me a critical thing. That if they do not accept low growth as fact of life, they will do things that will lead to consequences uh, like the ones that we've seen over the last two years. Such as not attack, tackling the fiscal, fiscal deficit. Fiscal deficit, high inflation, and with that, you know, yeah, the exchange rate will be fine for a few years and then it will come crashing down and all sorts of macroeconomic instability will come up very soon thereafter. I think, I think that's a political acceptance. I think the technocracy has accepted low growth. I think the, it requires a, politi a political acceptance of a low growth environment. That, that's what we're going to face in the next three, four years. That's time. number one. That's number one. And number two, I would agree with Ida that we re really require financial sector changes, mm -hmm. serious financial sector. I mean, there is this sense in India that somehow or the other, magically, India got saved both in the 1998 Asian crisis as well as in the 2008 global crisis. If you actually look at, in 1998, India was not even a blip in the radar of foreign investors. In 2008, if you look at the cost of the policy that India actually implemented since October of 2008 and let's say March of 2009, this was one of the costliest across every emerging market. By far the costliest policy package that India had to put up in order to, quote unquote, save itself from the damages of the global and number three? And number three, environment. I mean, that's environment much in a much more broader sense, because environment in a sense, uh, from mining to land acquisition to everything is related to what is it that we want to do in terms of 
environmental protection. Well, we have a new land acquisitions bill, don't we? But anyway, we'll yeah, get on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, to add to that, I think there's a lot of, uh, and I didn't have a third point, so I'll add to it. <laughs> <laughs> that the interaction between firms and state needs to change. I mean, today it's all based on go get permission for everything you want to do, and you have to run around getting permissions. And the government, you know, there'll be bri bribes get taken. And that whole, the interface between this, uh, there has to be a complete overall thinking yeah, about but, but, this, but, because but, we had this command and control economy. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah but, but, but that's basically where I told, but my point is that the technocracy played that role between the firm, between the state and the private sector in the absence of any institutional change for a very long time. That technocracy, and I agree with you, Lad, that technocracy is being shackled by all sorts of transparency and right to information, et cetera, et cetera, and lack of political protection. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, let, let's have some questions. Um, and we've got, a, we've got a mic. And I, I think I'll take them one by one. I know often people collect questions, but I think it's better one after the other. So, um, Isabel. Thanks. Uh, I was in, in India in, in end of August when the rupee was depreciating very fast, and everybody was asking for the minister, Minister Chidambaram, to come and say something to the public. And I was surprised that he came with a list of investments that were being cleared by this committee, yep. as, and that would be what would solve the growth problem in the short run, but none of you even uh, mentioned them. Why is that disconnect? Because I think those, all those projects were cleared and not a single shovel to the ground was <laughs> actually applied. No one actually did anything with those approved projects. Um, because of the concerns about um, what happens once I start the project, what happens two years down the road, how will the political environment change uh, in the next six months, and corporate India has not been investing since 2008. Just hasn't been investing, period. And, you know, we, there are lots of ad hoc reasons, but I would say, sorry? Animal spirit. No, and, no, no. Uh, yeah, there's a lot more to that. Yeah, I mean, a, I mean it is diff very difficult to, for anyone to do any kind of uh, investment today. I mean, the cost of investment uh, in terms of the implementation risk that you're taking is seriously high. And unless that is taken care of, and that's where the implicit contract broke down. And I think the cost of the, breaking down the implicit contract is that the cost of imp the implementation risk now of any project is significantly higher than it was, let's say, in 2007 and 2008. So one is the implementation risk, and that's very high, global uncertainty and implementation risk. But also that many people had People were very optimistic and before, and so then they had bid for projects. Those projects were over-optimistic. Today, even when you clear them, they are not viable projects. So that's part of the problem. Another big problem today is that, especially for infrastructure, most infrastructure companies have very damaged balance sheets because their pro they had overbid and the, all their projects got stalled or there were environmental issues because of which they got uh, stalled. Uh, about 20 of the big infrastructure companies are in uh, restructuring, the CDR, which is the corporate debt restructuring, and their balance sheets are not in a position to start new projects. Their bankers' balance sheets are weak as well. Their non-performing assets are rising. The bankers are not in a position to help them restart new projects. So both financially and in terms of uncertainty, implementation risk, it's not a time to, it's, that's why investment announcements have gone down like that. Last year, India added 21,000 megawatts of power. This year, they haven't managed to run any of those plants because there is no coal. Right. Thank you. Sadhana uh, from the American Enterprise Institute. I have a question for both of you. Um, let's just say hypothetically that India doesn't get this wonderful government that puts in place financial sector reforms and fixes the environment issue and does all these good things. And instead you get a sclerotic, weak, say UPA3, worse than this government, no decisions. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean you sort of, that India stays at this three and a half, four? Or does that mean that if this is cyclical to a large degree, that even with a really bad government, 
we can expect India to bounce back. So what's your kind of, what's your worst case scenario, or what's your scenario where governance, I, I don't mean gets worse, but let's just say governance remains at the level we've seen, doesn't improve. What is the outcome, what's the outlook for the economy under those circumstances? Do you want to go? No? I don't, yeah. yeah, so first I don't think, Sadhan, and that it'll depend so much about whether it's a UPA 3 or it's an NDA 2 or a BJP 1. I really don't think that it's going to make that much of a difference. I mean, look, look, at, look at the last 20 years, okay? We've had many governments come in and go out, and uh, they've all broadly supported market-based economies except the left. Okay, leave, leave the communists, and, and the communists are today not that powerful. So if it is a communist government, let's just say that the CPI and the CPM have <laughs> get it to 72, then, then I agree with you that it's a bad government. Anybody else, actually. I think everybody is out to, okay, this is a pie that can grow. I can get a share, and if the pie goes bigger, I can get it. We still haven't figured out how we make it grow, but we all gain if it grows. So unless you give the CPM 272, I don't worry that much, and I don't think that's a probabilistic scenario. So I think whoever the government is, whatever the nature of the government, next three, four years are going to be bad because the kind of institutional changes we need are not going to be easy to do for anybody. And my sense is that whoever it is will try to push for changes because, you know, they'll all try to get out of the present situation. I'm not as pessimistic as she is. Okay. Um, so if you look at the way in which corporate India has been behaving, and I will take Ila's description narrative to be very much the case that in 2007-8 they had 9% growth going on forever, rupee at 40 forever, and life is wonderful forever. Uh, that didn't really materialize. And in 2008 till date, they're basically, essentially, if you look at any corporate boards or any annual reports, every project has, quote unquote, first been delayed and then been shelved. I think once you get some sort of a resolution on the political front, once there is some sort of belief back in Indian corporates, and mostly in EM corporates by and large, not just in Indian corporates, that G3 growth, even though it may not be as big as it used to be back in 2008, G3 growth is going to be far less volatile and it's going to be low but stable for some time. Once you get those two things ingrained in people's mind, I think corporates both in EM Asia, including, I mean EM world, in, 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 including in India, I think will start now, now now changing their projects. It'll be smaller projects. It won't be as ambitious a project, but they will start doing that. And they still haven't done that. So if they actually do that, and those two, again, hinges on a politic political resolution, and political resolution, I mean, it doesn't really matter who comes, and I agree with Ida. It doesn't really matter who comes. Somebody has to come. Uh, and 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 much more. What is what really is happening to uh, global demand? But it could be another weak and indecisive government, and that would be fine. I think they will try and work around the weak and indecisive government. It was when the weak and indecisive government tried to actively inter inter interfere in the economy as a weak and indecisive government. That's when the problem started. If the weak and indecisive government says, "Look, I'm going to stay away from the uh, pri uh, from from the from the economy." Uh, that's fine. Benign neglect, or even, not even benign neglect, non-benign neglect, whatever that means, <laughs> I mean, is perfectly fine. <laughs> I mean, it is when you actively do things, and that, which are the wrong things. So, 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 so what I would be scared of is if the, let's say, whichever government comes into power, BJP or UPA, says that we want to reverse everything that's happened over the last three years, uh, and we want to target 9% growth rate. Life will, India will be in serious trouble, if I that's mean, what the government Jahangir, is. They haven't even started announcing investment projects now. So suppose you give it 
nine months, yep. right? And then after that, they, they say, oh, wow, this government is great. We start announcing. It takes two years to start something. True, you know? so true. So you need, you have a two and a half, three years at I, least I, of a I, lag I, no, before you can turn around. I agree, but the but you, you can get enough amount of sentiment-driven activity on consumption side and on uh, going around just based on that. Just capacity expansion That's will true. happen for some time. Sometime. Yeah, so you could get to what, five? Yeah, yeah. I don't who's know talking about anything more than that? <laughs> what are we talking about? I mean, that's my other thing. If they get, f if they yeah, accept if five, they get five, that's that. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. If they accept <laughs> five, I think you know we've done. You know, we'll be doing well if they just accept five, five. and a half. Yeah, if exports yeah, in the next three years, if yeah. the US does well, yeah. um, the lady on the left. Oh, sorry, you're the person. Yeah, I, I, I do apologize. Um, question. Michael. Um, I, mean, I can think of good and bad scenarios. I'd like your view on a, um, a bad scenario, which is, I think, um, uh, in which we're not so much blaming the politicians. And this is if um, any, any political party, given India, cannot avoid responding or being, having a narrative of responding to the emerging aspirations. And if you like, one of the other institutional failures was that because of the booming revenues, they were able to get away with highly inefficient, quote, populist policies. Yep. But ones that had to be delivered somewhere yep. in, or the other. That's one. Sorry. Also, in this booming period, there was a, uh, to pick up on what Ila's point, a kind of half-baked deal between the government and the corporate sector. It's a kind of somewhat legal, somewhat shady, and now that can't happen now. So given that, it's almost like you could paint a scenario where there's a systemic shift. The old ways of business aren't going to work. Still have to meet that, these aspirations. And in the meantime, there's this, there's this debt overhang. A corporate debt overhang and driven by a combination of the rising expectations and the, the, and the tight... <laughs> is this... Sorry. <laughs> is, Harvard, Harvard is this feasible? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, there was, sorry, it's feasible. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Is what feasible? <laughs> <laughs> it is a likely scenario. Sorry. I mean, you have, you, you'll take some time to clean up the uh, balance sheets. It's going to take time. It's, um, in the meanwhile, we're in this deep uh, slowdown of, it. so the uh, tax collection has really plunged. And this time it's looking like it's going to be worse than last year. It's not going to be easy to clean that up, get taxes back. I, I think that uh, they're going to try and make uh, mm, subsidy delivery far more efficient. So even though they've, uh, you know, they've set up this whole welfare scheme and that welfare scheme and so on, I think the uh, uh, infrastructure that is being put in place through Aadhaar and bank accounts, and it's like, okay, we have to somehow get money to people who are excluded from growth, but we can't afford to do it with a 50% leakage. So we now need to still get the money to them, but do it more efficiently. So. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you look at any of these, um, you know, Freedom House, heritage, measures of transparency, governance, etc., all of them are pro-cyclical. Uh, sentiments about how great your government is doing depends entirely on how you are feeling. If you're feeling bad, government is doing really, really badly. If you're doing well, government is doing extremely well. So to your point that why can't a muddied scenario where you're really not sure what is the relationship between the state and the private sector, why can't that keep on working as long as the urban middle class uh, does not is, is given some amount of you know side payments so to speak. Uh, you know you, you you allow wages to grow a little bit. You allow, allow asset prices to go a little bit. You allow real estate prices to grow a little, little bit. Uh, and you know every aspirational parent. Okay, fine. So you don't get into I am Ahmedabad, but you get into some. Your son gets into some sort of a management school. I think middle class will tolerate that environment and that. Uh, that, that this thing for quite some time. I, do, I don't see middle, urban middle class basically saying I'm turning Latin American 
without an actual Latin American style crisis. And these group, these politicians, I mean the economic policy makers in India, both in the UPA and in the NDA, are extremely good at avoiding any kind of a Latin American style crisis. You need a three, four, five years, that kind of a crisis for the urban middle class to create a new consensus and push that consensus on the government. That's not going to happen. You get a 5% growth in Ila's my framework, life is bad, not that bad. Jhangir, let me pick up on that last point. Would you go so far as to say that the urban middle class uh, has not only not come up with a consensus, they've actually perverted the old consensus. They contributed to corruption. They've exited the public system. They haven't invested in institutions. They've benefited from subsidies they didn't deserve from corruption that accrued to their interests. So do they have an – everyone talks as if the middle class will be the savior, but is there a way in which they've been just as complicit as everyone else? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. I mean, I mean, there is a, there is, I mean, I mean, there was a sort of an emerging social consensus, social compact that was being, that was working, which was that the urban middle class and rural middle class, in the sense of those who were benefiting from the acquisition of land, for example, as long they were being, they would be allowed to make money, and in exchange for that, they would be asked for two percent of GDP of fiscal subsidies to keep social stability through the, you know, the unemployment programs and this and that and the other. And as you know, Michael's pointing out and you know, both of us were talking about, I think the fact that the economy slowed and revenue started to collapse made both the sides of the equation, the ability to deliver the 2% subsidy and the ability to keep on allowing urban middle class to keep on having incomes grow at 15, 16%, both of them came to a head crash. I think that's what why the urban middle class is really mad at. That yes, we are willing, to, uh, you know, to go along with this uh, social compact as long as we are getting from there a 15, 16 percent of annual income growth. And we were used to it from 2003 to 2009, 10. Suddenly, it's disappearing. And I think that's what's really, really bothering them. Uh, I've a question that yeah. I meant to ask but forgot. Since you both seem to be agreed that there isn't a premium attached to That's it. not a good thing, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Two <laughs> economists agreeing. Yeah, yeah. this is unusual. <laughs> you, won't, you won't get a Nobel Prize. Yeah. <laughs> um, since, since you both agree on, on the fact that Modi wouldn't be an economic premium for India, that a Modi prime ministership wouldn't be any different. No, no, but, but no, both of us agree that there will be a massive premium on the asset side. On the asset yeah, side. Yeah, yeah, not necessarily. Stocks are yeah. going to go through the Zoom. roof. Zoom. Yeah, yeah, sentiment-wise, um, but that, that won't necessarily be long-lived. But in terms of what you said on the structural side, you, you, you seem skeptical. So could you enumerate what you think the downside of a Modi prime, minist prime ministership would be? Would there, would there be a communal dimension here? Would there be a Pakistan relations dimension here? Um, or, is he, <laughs> or is he a kind of Sharon figure who put that behind him? So I'm not, uh, I'm not sure what he stands for today. I'm not sure what his foreign policy is. I'm not sure what his vision is. I'm not... I've not even heard him talk about, uh, uh, so whatever limited speeches I've heard have been mainly against the Congress. So it's not clear to me what he stands for. So I'm not sure how to, if he stands for nothing, which is that if he hasn't made these speeches, I, know, I do know that there are many groups getting around all over India, certainly becoming very proactive, saying, we'll give him a vision. You know, let's write down what he needs to do. Uh, is, is this a case of him just keeping his vision quiet? Um, I don't know that he has a vision. vision. No, I don't know that he has a vision. So, for example, uh, one did not expect him to support the food security bill. Mm -hmm. Okay, Business did not expect him to support uh, the land acquisition bill because he was supposed to be pro-government and the land acquisition bill that has been brought in changes uh, increases the cost of uh, acquiring land. So I would say that if he does not have a vision because I've not heard what that vision is. And if we get a leader who does not have a vision uh, to take, to, you know, make India a modern, vibrant, liberal democracy, then 
that is the biggest downside. I, I, I have no idea what's going to. Do you agree with that? I'm not too worried about the vision thing. You can create a vision thing. I mean, you're going to get a bunch of people. No, no, Hagi. I'm not. Uh, my vision is not like as superficial as your sense of vision. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm not too worried about the way. I'm, the so, by my question. <laughs> that we know is exhibited in the past is not exactly reassuring. Yeah, but, you know, but people, but, but, but look, I mean, he was uh, chief minister of Gujarat in 2008 when that event took place, just become a chief minister, right? 2002. 2002. Today, he's going to be the prime minister of India. It's like, you know, somebody being in the opposition and saying, I'm going to do all these things, and then the person is actually going into government. The responsibility of, the constitutional responsibility will have, will, 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 will force narrow down what he can do, what he can't do, what his vision can be or not be. So I'm not... not going to be a Debbie Gowder, right? Uh, no, mm, yeah, but Debbie Gowder was for a few days. We didn't, we, no, 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 for, no, no, he was for a few days. Debbie. We didn't, don't know what Debbie Gowder would have become in three years' time or four years' time if he was allowed to this thing. But that's not what I'm afraid of. What I'm afraid of is that if you look at the Gujarat, the, story, the narrative that goes with the Gujarat model, here is Narendra Modi, and here are technocracies. Mm -hmm. There is no one in the middle. And he is delivering this huge growth, working with the technocracy, technocrats, to deliver the growth rate. You can do that in Gujarat. You can't do that in a central government. So my usual question is, to those who believe in the Gujarat state model, name me one minister of his cabinet. Anyone. Even the one who was in prison? <laughs> Even, name him. I will, I just name one person from his cabinet other than him. Elon. That's for you, not for me. So name? One person in his cabinet. Like this home minister who went to <laughs> No, no, no. no. This <laughs> some <laughs> guy was some this thing. Name it, name it. Who ordered it? Michael Pandey is in prison. <laughs> um, next question. I think we've got time for a couple, couple more. Uh, yes, the gentleman at the back. Oh, no, you, are you a... Mike distributor. Right. <laughs> Sorry, the gentleman sitting over there. So my question is very simple. Uh, I, I'm Anit Mukherjee. I used to be Ila's colleague at NIPFP. Um, name one uh, member of the cabinet of Nitish Kumar's government in Bihar. So, but Modi, social Modi? No, he's not there yet. He's yeah, not there but, yet. Yeah, but, no, but he was a key part in the part of Nitish Kumar's government that delivered that growth rate. No, I'm, I'm so, just saying a current government. I don't need to know because the current government hasn't done anything. <laughs> The part of the government that did deliver uh, the thing, Sushil Modi was a critical part of that government. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, more questions? Yes, sir. Please, sorry, I should have said this at the beginning. State your name. And sure. Uh, Brian Beery, Washington correspondent for Europolitics newspaper. And I just had a question about um, trade policy because I, I cover a lot of the trade agreements and I don't know the situation in India as regards is this on the radar at all. But there's a lot of changes with, you know, the WTO things have uh, come to a standstill. And uh, a lot of people point to the finger blame at India when that happened um, several years ago. Um, and now you have the two giant uh, regional trade agreements between Europe and the United States. And then you have the Trans-Pacific. And I know that China is sort of waking up to, you know, the implications of that. I'm just wondering if this issue features on the radar in Indian politics and if there's any viewpoint on, on, on international trade policy. Good question. Ida? I'm not sure that it's, I mean, the, it's a question, is it does it feature on the radar of Indian politics? Then not particularly, no. no. So it's, uh, when there is a WTO uh, meeting and India has to go in and disrupt it for a few days, we see it. Uh, you know, it makes headlines that, you know, India stopped everything from happening. <laughs> and by the way, in those, and, in, 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 and during those days, there's consensus within India that what the government's approach is, 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 is the right it? thing. So, you know, everybody kind of, there, the, wow. But you know, it doesn't yeah. matter with which side of the spectrum you are, you are on. There's complete consensus that nothing should be given up for, 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 for example, in agriculture. There's is complete there consensus. Groups like the TPP obviously won't include India. So no, that they, it's not a Pacific nation. No, no, no. And there is very little appetite for an Indo-US FTA now, at yeah. the moment at least. Yeah. The, the yeah. I'm the only thing that's been talked about, the FTA with Pakistan. But that's much yeah, but that's because uh, First, they have to give us the MFN status. So yeah. That's where yeah. it's stuck. That the only thing you talk about is M 
Pakistan has not given India the MFN status. They need to get their politics right. But that's about, okay, we gave it to them 10 years ago. So that's about Since around your hands up, I'm going to smuggle another quick question in. <laughs> now, as Sharif um, is here this week, um, and I think on Wednesday he's going to the White House, um, is Pakistan going to play? And, and they're having their $1.6 billion, whatever it is, U.S. civilian aid restored quietly. Um, is, is Pakistan going to play any role in this, in this election? I don't see Pakistan playing a role in this election. What will be the issues yeah. in this election, so other than they, corruption they, they, and governance? There seem to be corruption and governance okay. seem to be the issues All of right. this election. All right. Uh, I think, sorry, I keep saying I think we've got time for one more. Do, does anybody have any idea what the time is? Yeah, I'm just guessing. Four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. That's, that's four questions in, in my book. <laughs> uh, so so let's, let's see at least one of them. Oh, two of them. I'm starting with you. So it, it might not actually be a question, but uh, Ila, like you brought up, uh, why, mo why BJP didn't vote, uh, vote, uh, voted against uh, land acquisition or food, food bill? At this point of time, when elections are so near, no one is going to antagonize uh, local population for that matter. My point is uh, whether uh, with Modi being elected or NDA being elected, is there going to be patchwork which will, uh, as, uh, as you said, which will lead to uh, super economic growth, uh, pseudo economic growth rather, or will there be a visionary uh, move towards uh, economic growth in the long term? So that is, uh, that is what, whether Modi is capable of doing that or not. So, so, uh, chance to change your views on Modi. I mean, that's the <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> So why would, so suppose I stood against uh, handouts, then why would my supporters be upset if I continue to stand against handouts? So I don't see why you would argue that uh, not supporting the food security bill was against, would upset voters. If my, if, if my ideology, look at what the communists have been doing. I mean, okay, in my past life I was one, but now I'm not. <laughs> but look at what the communists say. If they say that they're opposing... Uh, India's friendship with the U.S., let's say, you know, so, or any other uh, issue which is not really something that the bulk of the population supports or, their vote, or various voters support, but they have their own uh, supporters, and those supporters are fine with the view they take. So the point I'm trying to make, I was trying to make was that if Modi stands for minimal government, if Modi does not support handouts, and a welfare state like the food security bill, then his supporters support him because he stands for that, because he does not support those things. Now suddenly, if I was to say, because elections are near, so I change my stand, that's a very odd thing to say. That means I don't really have that ideology. I never actually was supporting reducing the state or not having a welfare state. I, am I just opportunist that today I'll, I'll do whatever the voters feel? But you've heard of bait and switch, right? I mean, it's a common, it's a common <laughs> practice in politics. <laughs> so that, that was, and it's again, a for the... question, because we have one actual one I'm left. Sorry, there was a gentleman in the same row as you who had their hand up. Yes. And you can continue answering. While all uh, these political um, dynamics uh, are continuing, as they have done for a very, very many years, I'm interested to know the extent to which the, the Indian diaspora is able to make any difference to the kind of the, the economic dynamics, given the fact that you have now about $70 billion a year coming in through remittances and, a, and, a, and an enormous uh, return of uh, Indian capital and Indian entrepreneurial skills from the US and other countries. And I'm interested to know to the extent to which this is a dynamic which can actually you know, make a difference vis-a-vis -vis the kind of traditional, if you like, difficulties or, or if you like, gridlock of Indian politics. I think, you know, uh, you want me to go ahead and think? Okay, I think that um, the relate, I mean, the kind of role, let's say, the Chinese diaspora played in the initial years of China's development, where they were the ones who established the beginnings of the supply chain, which would originate in the west coast of the United States of America and go to China. Um, I don't think that the Indian diaspora ever intends to play that role or even wants to play that role. 
so in terms of what is it that they can do to change, my guess is very limited in terms of apart from bringing in $70 billion of remittances, and let's say another $10 billion of uh, you know, in non-resident Indian deposits, they really do not have that much of a role to play either in other portfolio inflows or in FDI. That's not the way in which the Chinese diaspora worked. Uh, so it's much more in terms of influencing politics, perhaps, uh, but not in really going and setting up, let's say, a complete new supply change for pharmaceuticals. I'm just making this up or textiles, or something like that, the way in which the Chinese diaspora did. They established the supply chain but way before the multinationals, way before Walmart had come into the supply chain, this thing of China. They were the ones who were, who were running the supply chain. Has there been a Miss USA from China? Sorry, that wasn't a question. Uh, Let me try to think. <laughs> um, do you want to respond to that? Or, because I think we are at the end of time. No, I'm, um, I agree pretty much. Except if I would like to see them play a role in, uh, you know, go from Silicon Valley and play a similar role in India. Sure. But, but is but, that something that's happening? Mm, Not that much, no. no. Thank well, thank you to both of you. Some very illuminating answers and, and for your sure. patience. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.